Well, welcome to this podcast where we're going to be thinking about the digestive system or the gastrointestinal system. So digestive is really referring to its function, whereas gastrointestinal describes the whole system, pointing out that it includes the gastric in the intestine, the stomach and the, and the bowels. Now, the functions of the digestive system can be summarised in, in four components. Ingestion, digestion, absorption and elimination. Now, ingestion refers to taking food and water into the body. This is the process of eating and drinking. And ingested food molecules are often large and insoluble. And in order for them to be absorbed into the body, they must first be broken down into smaller subunits. And the process of converting large ingested food molecules into a form which may be absorbed is termed digestion, the breaking down process. And after food has been digested, it must then be absorbed into the bloodstream or into the lymphatic system of the body before it can be utilised for physiological processes and for fuel for all of the body's energy production. And the process whereby digested food is transferred from the lumen of the gut into the circulatory system is called absorption. So lumen just means the hole down the middle the inside part of the gut, the lumen of the gut. And from there, it needs to go into the circulatory system. And as we've said, food is either absorbed into the blood circulatory system or the lymphatic circulatory system in this process of absorption. Now, not all the ingested material is absorbed. Some continues along the length of the gastrointestinal tract and is eliminated as waste. It's not broken down by chemical digestive processes. So fibre clearly falls into this category. Fibre is not broken down by any digestive process and is eliminated in the same chemical form it was eaten in. Now it can be in smaller bits, we can break it up when we chew it, but it's not chemically broken down and we do not derive nutritional molecules from the fibre. That's not to say that fibre is not useful, it is, it's absolutely essential because it provides bulk for the peristalsis, for this rhythmic movement of the gastrointestinal tract to work against. And this greatly improves what we call the motility of the material going through the gastrointestinal tract, the movement. So fibre is very important, for example, for preventing constipation, which we don't want. And water is also absorbed into the blood in unaltered form as simple H2O. Now, if we think about the structures of the gastrointestinal tract, essentially the GI tract, or or sometimes we just call it the gut. Gut is kind of a biological term. It means related to the gastrointestinal tract. And and really the gut or the gastrointestinal tract is, is a single tube which runs from the mouth all the way through to the anus. Now, of course, it does vary as it goes through and it varies in thickness and there's various different sizes of the lumen, but it's all basically one tube that goes all the way through the body. And people used to think it was a bit like a canal running through the body. So the old fashioned name for the gastrointestinal tract is the the alimentary canal. Now, if we're thinking a bit broader, really, we could call the digestive system the organs of the gastrointestinal tract and the so-called accessory organs of digestion. So we could say that the digestive system consists of the organs which compose the gastrointestinal tract itself and the accessory organs of digestion. Now these accessory organs are not part of the tract. They're not part of this canal, this gut that runs all all the way through the body. But they do produce and secrete enzymes and other fluids that are essential for the digestive processes. So immediately we might think of the salivary glands putting saliva into the mouth and we might think of the liver delivering bile into the duodenum and we might think of the pancreas delivering pancreatic digestive enzymes into the lumen of the duodenum. So these are all accessory organs of the digestive system. Not part of the GI tract themselves but essential for the functioning that goes on within the gastrointestinal tract. Now, when you start learning about the gastrointestinal tract, it's useful simply to memorise the order in which material goes through the tract. 
So from the mouth, swallowed material is going to go into the esophagus, this food pipe that runs through the thoracic cavity, takes the food down through the diaphragm into the abdominal cavity and into the stomach. From the stomach, the food goes into the first part of the small intestine, which is called the duodenum, and then into the second part of the small intestine, which is called the jejunum. And the third part of the small intestine is the ileum. From here, material goes into the large intestine or colon. And the first part of that is the cecum. And the appendix is a blind ended pouch from the cecum. Material then rises up the ascending colon, through the transverse colon, down the descending colon, into the sigmoid colon, rectum, and finally anus. So we can simply memorize those, esophagus, stomach, duodenum, jejunum, ileum, cecum appendix, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum and anus. That's the introductory material to the gastrointestinal tract that you just need to memorize. Now, just to give you a few pointers anatomically, as we've said, the esophagus goes down through the thoracic cavity. And then we have the stomach and the stomach goes from left to right. And then the duodenum is behind the large intestine or the colon. And then the small intestines are largely in the middle part of the abdomen. Now, if you put your hand on the right hand side of your abdomen at the bottom, just above your hip, on the right hand side, that is the position of the cecum. Then if you run your hand up the right hand side of your abdomen to underneath the right ribs, that is the path of the ascending colon. And then the colon actually bends there and the organ just under your right costal margin, just under your ribs on the upper right hand side of the abdomen, the organ there is the liver. So there's a bend there called the hepatic flexure. A flexure is a bend. Then if you run your hand from the top right of your abdominal cavity or the top right of your abdomen over to the top left of your abdomen, that is the path of the transverse colon. And then if you put your hands underneath the left costal margin, the organ there is the spleen. So that bend from the transverse colon into the descending colon is the splenic flexure, the bend by the spleen, the splenic flexure. Then if you run your hand down the left side of your abdomen to just above your left pelvic bones, that is the path of the descending colon. Now, of course, the anus is back from there. The anus is posterior. So the sigmoid colon goes back through the abdomen and then we have the rectum, which is a back at the back, just above the anal opening and, and then the anus itself. So the sigmoid colon is running back from the end of the descending colon to the start of the rectum running posteriorly in the direction of the anus. Now let's start thinking about this fascinating process of digestion. Now in digestion, food molecules are broken down into simpler components, which may later be absorbed. And this is achieved by the operation of two processes. The first is physical, the second is chemical. The first physical process we call mechanical digestion. And the second chemical process is called chemical digestion. And by the end of the overall digestive processes, proteins are broken down into amino acids, carbohydrates into simple sugars, and fats into fatty acids and glycerol. Now let's think about mechanical digestion first. Food is physically broken down by chewing. This is the process of mastication taking place in the mouth. So mastication just means to chew up. The food is then swallowed and once food is in the stomach, there are regular peristaltic contractions about every 20 seconds called mixing waves. And these mixing waves churn the gastric contents into a mixture called chyme. And chyme is then peristaltically squeezed along the small intestine and is subject to further mixing. And these physical processes break up and therefore increase the surface area of the food. 
and this is very important because it gives a larger surface area over which enzymes can subsequently act. So we notice that this peristaltic process, the contraction and relaxation of the smooth muscle in the wall of the gastrointestinal tract, is that which moves material along the gastrointestinal tract and is responsible for this process of chyme formation as there is churning in the stomach. Now also in the process of mechanical digestion, we could include the action of bile. So bile comes from the liver via the gallbladder and down the bile ducts and into the duodenum. And the bile does not digest fat, but it does emulsify the fat. So it takes large globules of fat and turns them into very small microscopic globules of fat forming an emulsion. So milk, for example, is an emulsion of fat. So bile will emulsify the fats, which is essentially a physical process. It's not a chemical process that comes after with the effect of the digestive enzymes, which brings us on to the role of uh, chemical digestion using digestive enzymes. Now you might know that there's two sorts of enzymes in the body. There's intracellular and there's extracellular. Now intracellular enzymes catalyze all biochemical reactions, facilitating and increasing the rate of biochemical reactions inside the individual cells. But the enzymes concerned with digestion only break down large molecules into smaller molecules. And digestive enzymes are produced by exocrine glands, which as we've mentioned are part of these accessory organs of digestion. And once formed, the digestive enzymes produced by the exocrine glands in the accessory organs act within the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract itself. Now, many digestive enzymes are enzyme precursors rather than the enzymes themselves. And this is to prevent the enzyme products digesting the glands in, in which they are produced. And enzyme precursors are normally converted into an active form of the enzyme in the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract, where they're not going to do any harm. For example, trypsin is an enzyme which will digest proteins. And this is formed as trypsinogen in the pancreas. Now, trypsinogen is inactive and will not break down the protein molecules in the pancreas itself. However, when exported from the pancreas into the lumen of the small intestine, it is then converted into its active form, which is trypsin. Because, of course, if it were synthesized in the pancreas as the end product trypsin, which is proteolytic, the pancreas would itself be digested as of course the pancreas is largely composed of protein itself. And this is actually what goes wrong if someone gets pancreatitis. In pancreatitis, there's premature activation of these enzyme precursors, whereby they're converted into the active form of the enzyme, which does indeed start to digest the pancreas itself. As you would expect, this is a very painful condition and pain is felt at the top of the abdomen in the area called the epigastrium. So it just shows the physiological importance of enzymes not being activated within the pancreas itself. Now, active enzymes are unable to damage the lining of the gastrointestinal tract itself because the gut lumen and the mucosa is protected by a layer of mucus. So the lining of the gastrointestinal tract is a mucosa and a mucosa is a lining which produces mucus. And this mucus is impervious to the digestive enzymes. So the enzymes can happily digest material within the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract, but are prevented from digesting the wall of the gastrointestinal tract itself by this protective mucus barrier. But again, if this mucus barrier is broken down, then that can result in ulceration as digestive enzymes start to digest the wall of the gut. And this is what happens in peptic ulcers. So peptic ulcers are caused when peptic juices produced by the mucosa of the stomach, produced in the wall of the stomach, are able to access the actual tissues which compose the gastrointestinal tract and will digest them. So peptic ulceration can occur in the stomach 
uh, in the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. And if there's regurgitation, it can also occur in the lower part of the esophagus. So again, this just shows the physiological importance of this mucous membrane, that it all needs to be lined with mucus to protect the gastrointestinal tract from the enzymes that are so active within the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract.